to go really, really fast, and the traditional way of doing AppSec was just a non-starter. So I kind of looked at what Agile, DevOps, CI, CD was doing, tried to mash all that together in my head in a way that made sense for AppSec, and that's what this talk is about. Oh, and I'm Matt Tesaro. I'm a full-time employee now for OWASP as of the end of July, the beginning of August, which is actually really cool. Um, prior to that, I worked at Pearson with their AppSec program. We were eight-ish people. I can't remember exactly how many. I'm kind of fevery and sick. Um, before that, I worked at Rackspace, and I've done a bunch of consulting, and et cetera, et cetera. I've been around for a while. And I do think AppSec needs to change. I think the, the old way of doing it, at least for me, uh, needs to go. So I'm going to talk a little bit about custom coach work and bespoke AppSec. And what I mean by that is the way we do AppSec kind of now, and the, certainly the way I did AppSec prior to moving to Rackspace, was you had software that got developed and it went to pre-prod or UA or some such place and you had a testing window and you tested it and every test was kind of a one-off a la carte thing, right? Um, my favorite, and I, I have a screenshot somewhere I can't find, of the Gantt chart from PM when I worked at the Texas Education Agency where they had security testing and because they kept pushing stuff over because of deadline breakage, security testing, zero days, right? Like we have designed this to fail, this is awesome. So I don't think this bespoke AppSec is gonna work for us. Um, anybody know who this guy is? Who hasn't seen my talk before? Because I like this picture. Henry Ford, right? This is Henry Ford who said, you know what, this bespoke custom coach work that we did before we were building cars, right? You, you bought a car and you bought a coach worker and the coach worker made your coach and the body on your car, right? That's how cars happened before. And he said, you know, that's great, but I think everybody should have a choice of cars as long as they're a Model T and they're black, right? He sort of made the car easy button, right? And I think we need to do that for AppSec. Um, another thing that kind of really got me down this path was reading the Phoenix Project, which if you haven't read the Phoenix Project, don't do it now, but in, you know, an hour-ish, go out and order it on Amazon and read it. It is a fantastic book. I'm going to use the three ways of DevOps that are in the Phoenix Project to kind of frame this talk. So as I go through, I'll be speaking about all those. It is a super crazy, fantastic book. Actually, I do a training in line with this as well, and the day one of my training, I mentioned this book, and I had one of the guys in my class go out that night and buy it on his Kindle, and then came in the next morning, and he was kind of cursing me out. I'm like, dude, what's up? Because, man, I was up till 3 a.m. reading that freaking book you recommended. I do that on day two. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so... Wait till it's over, go buy it, it is super fantastic. So the number one of those three ways of DevOps is workflow. Looking at your purpose and the processes which aid it. And in AppSec, your workflow is the work of your AppSec team. This is, a lot of this was driven by the fact that at Pearson and at Rackspace, I was part of an AppSec team and kind of managing running that group. Um, and so for AppSec, your real purpose is to give the business an assessment of the security state of that application you're looking at, right? That's the goal. The goal is to tell the business, this thing's pretty good, this thing's a basket case, this thing's a rock star from a security perspective, right? And then the business can say, you know what, we're going to make a ton of money on this basket case. It's going out the door and we'll fix it as we go, or maybe they'll hold it back, or whatever the business decision is, right? But your role is to give them an honest, thorough assessment, ideally, of the security state of that application. So, what I ended up coming with in the culmination of going through this sort of journey from traditional waterfall, I had a week of testing because QA had a week of testing, honestly, at Texas Education Agency to Rackspace where we're deploying one group, the most aggressive group was deploying 75 times a day, was the fact that I had to change. And I took CI, CD and the fact of continuous deployment and continuous integration where you're constantly testing little bits together and tried to make that work for AppSec. Because um, <coughs> really what you want and really what every AppSec test is is the burrito your way, right? This is Chipotle. And you want a burrito with chicken and maybe sour cream and the extra spicy stuff but not the corn and an extra lettuce or whatever's your thing, right? So it is custom, but it's custom with a constrained number of choices. And that's how they can make it fast. And so 
I, Aaron actually came up with this graphic. He gets, was my co-project lead on the OWASP AppSec uh, pipeline project. But I really love this idea because this is really the embodiment of what I think AppSec pipelines need to be. They need to be custom within a confined set of choices. And that's how you can get speed, right? You can get a burrito, you can get a salad, but otherwise you only have n number of choices, not an infinite number. And they're certainly not cooking it as you go. So what does a AppSec pipeline look like, or rugged DevOps, or AppSec, DevOps, DopSec, Dev, whatever we want to call that thing of security and DevOps. I, I wish they would just pick a bloody name. <coughs> what does that look like generically? Um, after about three months of myself and Adam Parsons at Pearson kind of going meta and just working on making our team go faster and not really doing any air quotes AppSec work, Right? We just worked on tools that helped our team get better. We came up with this idea of an AppSec pipeline where you have intake on the far right. That's where you're having requests coming in or jobs coming in or things you have to test coming in. We're going to track them in some sort of something to keep track of those things. Who's, on, who's got app X? Who's got app Y? App X needs a threat model. App Y needs a manual pen test. We're going to do a static scan of app Z. Right? All that's managed in the intake process. And once you have those requests coming in, you have to triage them and decide what work they're going to get, right? Maybe you have a project that wants the full suite of static, dynamic, threat model, and, every, and a manual test and all of it, but they're a very low risk and quite honestly low priority project. Well, in triage, you may just give them an automated scan and say, God bless you, move on with your life. We just don't have the bandwidth for it, right? That's what happened in the uh, triage position. And then in the testing position, we would take those activities, one or more activities per engagement, and then parcel them out to the team. This is really nice because we could parallelize the effort, right? If you have a couple people on your team, one guy can be the scanner runner, one guy can be the, you know, the threat modeler, one guy can do the manual assessments, right? And it also works nicely for a, a breadth of experience, right? If you have kind of the new person, Maybe they're only really good at maybe running a dynamic scammer because it's kind of handholdy. Maybe your senior person goes off and does the manual tests, right? But you can parallelize that at least a little bit, which is, is a good thing. <coughs> Ideally, all of the results of any testing, any testing activity will funnel into some sort of what we call vulnerability repository, a database of something, a storage thing, full of all the findings that you found while doing security activities, right? This thing has cross-site scripting on this web page with this parameter. There's SQL injection in this field on this URL. There's directory indexing at this web server at this path, right? All of that stuff gets summed up into a vulnerability repository. And then from there, you can deliver out results to your constituency, right? You can create metrics for either, well, usually for people north of you on the food and the org chart, right? Or metrics just to show that your program is being productive. Ideally, those findings for the dev teams aren't becoming PDFs. They're becoming bugs in a bug tracker, issues in an issue tracker, JIRA, tickets, whatever you do, whatever the devs do, I should say, that's where those findings go, right? Don't give them a PDF. That's just like DevOps talks, we'll talk about uh, devs throwing code over the wall. Like security chucked PDFs over the wall to devs for years. And like I used to be a dev and I'm in security, and if you'd handed me a 400 page PDF back when I was doing dev work all the time, I would have gone, yeah, that's nice, whoop, and moved on. Right, so let's at least put the findings, our security findings, in a, in a language and a format that they expect and know. Um, and if you have a GRC tool or something else, this all can happen in your vulnerability repository. Right? So this is the idea of an AppSec pipeline. And it's kind of taking the, uh, the concept of CICD, where you have a build pipeline where certain steps happen along the way and you end up with a finished product. This is you're doing certain activities, security activities along the way, and you end up with an assessment of an application. This was probably about three months-ish of work between myself and Adam. He worked on the front end. I worked on the back end. Um, and we had some help with other team members around the middle um, to get this done. This is sort of our generic concept of an AppSync pipeline. So key features. Probably the biggest A number one thing. Design this guy for iterative development. That's why I said three months. We didn't on January 1st. Uh, what was that, 2016, 15? I can't remember. I'm really out of it. On the year we decided to do this, <laughs> um, we didn't have it done. Like, I get to show you pretty charts because 
we had three months to do it. And we did this in little pieces over time. We were a little bit lucky that Adam and I could go meta because we had coverage from the other team members, so we still looked productive as an as a AppSec team. Um, but make sure that you can add this over time because you're never going to get the two straight weeks of time to knock this out, right? It has to be made to be put in Lego block style bit uh, by bit over time. <coughs> Once you get this in place, and honestly, you just even figuring out on a whiteboard what your workflow looks like, you now have a consistent vernacular terminology or reusable path for all of your activities. And if you start talking the same way internally, that will go to your external constituencies. And now you start to have better conversations with the dev groups, the PMs, et cetera. Because you're not saying scan when you really mean a manual test. You're not saying app scan when you mean a dynamic, right? It's all very, uh, it keeps it consistent and helps sort of the, I told my teams, both at Rackspace and at Pearson, to never use the scan word. It's kind of the S word, right? Because what's a scanner? The scanner is what my, well, now 12-year-old son can click next five times after putting in a URL and get a report, right? Not much value add in clicking next five times and getting a report. Like, obviously, my, my son can do it, and he can do it fine. Like, your real value add is running that thing, filtering the results, putting actionable findings together into issue trackers, right? That's why I hate the S word. <laughs> you have a one-way flow from left to right, right? From the intake coming in all the way out to reports and metrics. And you don't go back. So if you do an engagement with an application and you produce some findings and then N period later, they come back and say, hey, we fixed those five things. That's a new engagement. And it goes back through the pipeline. It's just a retest engagement, right? And we retest those findings. Um, it relies heavily on automation. We did tons and tons of glue code. None of this is like super big, crazy, thousands of lines, long programs. This is a lot of just little glue code to make A talk to B in a consistent way. And so you don't have to be like some uber crazy programmer to make this happen. I already said it grows in functionality over time. That's kind of part of the iterative development. And the biggest thing is gracefully interconnecting with the dev process, right? Because you want to talk to devs like they want to be talked to. Right? That if you want to get credence and buy-in from them, you have to speak their language. I mean, I'm just sorry. I don't go to France and expect to not be treated really. No offense, French people. Um, if I speak English to them, because I've never been to France, but I hear they'll be kind of a bit snippy with me if I speak English to them. They're out of luck, because that's all I know. But like, if I really want to be treated well in French, I better speak French, right? At least when I've traveled, when I went to Brazil, I learned, thank you, where's the bathroom? I don't speak Portuguese. Right? I at least learned those things. So I could say, look, dumb American, don't speak Portuguese. Can we swap to English, please? And hopefully they'll say yes. So here is the pipeline as we did it at Pearson, if you want a real world example. <coughs> um, starting on the far side, we had what we call the security services request. It went to this application called Bag of Holding. I tend to call it Bo. Um, Bo was written by Adam. It's up on GitHub. Uh, if you look for bag of holding, you can find it, Adam Parsons. That was where we kept track of who was doing what engagement, what engagements were pending, what requests are out, how long did they take us to do. All of that kind of stuff happened in bag of holding. From bag of holding, we were using uh, Stackstorm to do orchestration. Stackstorm is a, is a full-on orchestration uh, piece of OpenStack in, in all honesty and candor in retrospect. I probably wouldn't have picked Stackstorm. It was like a four-ton pickup truck to haul a bale of hay. It was really cool, and it had lots of dob, knobs and dials, but honestly, it was kind of overkill. But hey, we had it, and it worked. And we used probably 2% of its functionality. Um, from there, we would then branch out. We had check marks and Veracode for various political reasons. Um, you just need at least one static checker. Uh, most of the manual testing was done with our guys with Burp Suite. We had Zap, we had White Hat for production scanning. We had IBM's uh, app scan that's since been switched out with App Spider and Qualys. And by the way, it's since, since been switched out with App Spider is kind of a key phrase. We wrote this generically so that we could keep vendors honest and swap out tools and not interrupt our flow, right? For reasons, we decided to stop using App Scan and use App Spider, and there really wasn't that big of a deal, a little bit of glue code to write. But otherwise, swapping out a piece of that testing middle didn't matter. Because at the end, if we could put it into ThreadFix, which in our case was our source of truth for Pearson, if we could push it into ThreadFix, we're done. 
So as long as I could make it there, I really didn't care what the tool was. And Qualys was actually an outside, Qualys WAS is what we had. An outside group owned and controlled that. That wasn't even an app sex thing, but we heard about it and we thought, hey, can we have a feed from it? And we started reading from it and putting them in to so have a better picture of what's going on. So that wasn't even our tool. That was an outside party's tool, outside to the app set group's tool that happened to be there. So hey, well, let's ingest that too. Why not? Get a better perspective on what's going on. Whatever we did, and kind of the mantra was, if it isn't in ThreadFix, it didn't happen. Right? It all went into ThreadFix, and that's where we kept track. And that was our one source of truth, so to speak, for our vulnerabilities. All flowed in there. It would do deduping and um, normalization of the vulnerability schizophrenic uh, output formats. If you've ever looked at their XMLs, they're hideous and awful. Don't if you could help it. Um, from ThreadFix, we pushed into Jira for the various product teams. I wrote a whole bunch of code to pull metrics and reporting out of ThreadFix's API. Uh, if and when the Archer team ever gets Archer actually working, I guess we would have integrated with Archer. Um, I have it on the graph, but honestly, I should probably take it off because we never got it working before I left. So, you know, like most archers, whatever. Um, and then if we did have false positives, we could go into ThreadFix and fix them. Ideally, we wrote profiles inside of those testing tools narrow enough so that we didn't get false positives to begin with. For the higher risk, higher touch projects that we dealt with, we would end up hand holding those two or three times through the testing, the first time particularly for static analysis, but also for dynamic, and manually filter out the false positives and write a fairly solid profile for those tools, and then we would kind of turn on autopilot. Because you don't want to push like a whole shipload of false positives down into the vulnerability store, if at all possible. Well, that was Pearson's. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, where we started to go, and then I left, um, was to for those products that actually had DevOps going on, had CI, CD, had build pipelines, we were starting to inject small tools like Gauntlet or something like that, small test point tools into their CI, CD, and it's just a matter of pushing that thing up either to your orchestration layer or directly in your vulnerability repository if it has an API, and now you have yet another stream of information to give you visibility into the AppSec landscape, right? So. At Pearson, to be totally honest and full disclosure, when we first got there, there was eight companies of Pearson that got mashed into one about six months or so, I think, before I was hired. And it was pretty total chaos. <laughs> so for the AppSec team, when we sat down and kind of talked about this, we decided let's get our house in order first. And we built a pipeline that made us really fast. And once we got that, then we started reaching out to the more progressive bits of Pearson to start doing the CI, CD like this. Because honestly, when we first started, I was just happy we had a sane workflow. Because it was kind of like we, the team was either new hires or existing people from other bits of Pearson that got jammed into the central CISO org. So it took us a while even to figure out what was going on, quite honestly. But once you get a little more mature, you can actually now start reaching out to those dev teams that are doing CI, CD, and put those little tests and point them back into your flow. <coughs> Love this quote from Deming. Spending time optimizing anything other than the critical resource is an illusion, right? If you've ever gone to a DevOps talk, you've probably heard this, but it is absolutely fantastic. My supposition is, is that AppSec personnel are the critical resource. Like, raise hands who has too many people in their AppSec program. <laughs> Shockingly, once again, no hands raised, right? This is not news to anybody, right? We are all desperate to find qualified people to help us out, and we've got ridiculous amounts of work. So my thing is we have to optimize the people's time. The way you do that is you automate things that don't take a human brain, right? Like getting the URL and cred and passing them off to the person who's actually going to do that manual test, that's not really a brain activity. Right? We ended up in Bo having a credential manager. We could drop them in there. When it was your turn to test, you could pull them out of there and off you go. Right? Those kind of things that aren't human brain activities, automate those and have your people time spent on only brain activities. Right? <coughs> the other thing about doing this automation, particularly about the non-brain things, those are the things you don't care about. And you're kind of like quickly clicking through and you just want to be done with. If you automate them, you now get very consistent results. And this can be stupid, silly things. Uh, prior to Pearson, when I was a pen tester, 
we had a zip directory or zip, yeah, zip file that had a directory structure in it that had subdirectories for all the different tools we ran as our standard network pen test. Right? What do you do? New engagement, unzip it, name it the name of the client, run your tools, drop them in the right folders, and then if I get sick or I get moved off to a different client, no big deal. I just pass it off to the next guy. They know exactly where everything is. Oh, the nmap scans are in the nmap directory, right? Stupid trick, but it made us hugely consistent. Um, it greatly helps you increase, uh, check the stack, the brain not working, greatly increased tracking of work status. Uh, if you've managed people, you get the drive-by from managers up north of you that say, hey, who's on what? What have you worked on? When was the last time you looked at X? Right? If you have something like Bo or something managing all your engagements, it's a matter of quick login, go look at it. Oh, the last time we saw AppX was three months ago. We did a threat model and a static analysis. Done. Right? Not like that scratch, scratch, let me search my email, which is mostly how I did it prior. Um, great improvement in visibility and metrics. Right? I kind of knew it would take so long to do a dynamic test, but now we know. Like we have the last 10 times we did a dynamic test, it takes n days. Hey, guess what? We can, we can guesstimate now in our uh, scheduling that it takes n days, and I actually have numbers to back that up, not just ex rectus kind of thinking. <coughs> and ideally, you're going to reduce dev team friction, right? If you're talking their talk and putting stuff coherently and their actionable findings going into their JIRA or whatever issue backlog they have, you're going to get a lot more cred points, right? When you stop chucking that PDF bomb over the wall, right, you will actually make some friends with devs. At Rack, I knew I won when I had a developer come up to me and say, hey, we're talking about this really weird thing we want to change with auth. Can you come over and whiteboard with us? Because we're not sure what we're doing. I thought, cha-ching, I have won, <laughs> right? Like, they're searching me out. I'm not chasing them. That was super, super cool. Why do I like them? I already kind of talked about this. We have really good visibility into work in progress. Um, the other thing that's nice about this is when you get the manager say, oh my God, there's a fire drill, everybody drop everything, we all gotta go fix this thing that's now sideways, I can tell the manager, cool, we can do that, but these five things that are being worked on now ain't gonna happen. And a lot of times that turns into the conversation of, oh, well, that first and second one are actually kind of really critical too, so leave those guys on those, but I need those last three. Like, okay, great, like fine, if that's what you wanna do, let's do it. It wasn't a from the hip, like, crap, who's working on what? I could actually have a good conversation about particularly stealing what I would consider my resources from my team. I didn't like that when they re redirected my work. Um, how about, how about that? Yes. And the other thing that was nice about this, like I mentioned this earlier, it was flexible for a wide range of people, right? If, if you have some junior people and some senior people, you put them in the middle on that, in that section of test where they fit, right? So you have some junior people, maybe get to the easy kind of hook up the uh, static analysis or do the dynamic scan with the automated tool, but the senior ones actually do the filter false positives out of that essay work, or maybe setting up a manual test, right? Or doing a manual test. So what can an AppSec pipeline do for you? <coughs> so for Pearson, uh, from 2014 to 15, this is where I don't have to remember the dates, they're on my slide. Um, in 2014, we did 44 assessments in the AppSec team. In 2015, we did about 200. And the reason I have a tilde in front of there is because we really didn't get the pipeline up and going until the end of March, the beginning of April. And so our numbers for the first quarter-ish were a bit fuzzy. But myself and a couple of other teams tried to get these numbers and 200 was kind of what we got. But honestly, our reporting was really, unfortunately, bad for the first quarter. So we 5X increased the speed of work going through the AppSec team at Pearson. And honestly, a lot of this was just glue code and buffing off rough edges so that working at Pearson was easy instead of the inevitable, hey, you got to test this app. Oh, I don't have the URL and creds. Let me go talk to the PM. Let me wait for an email response. Right? All those things that are soul sucking about your job, like we got rid of those, right? We got rid of those. Because now if I don't have creds in the engagement thing in Bo, I don't assign it. Right? I don't even assign it. I assign the next one I actually have creds for, because like too bad so said, you won't give me creds off the plate, right? Done. <coughs> so the second way of DevOps, improve feedback, open yourself up to upstream and downstream information. That's the second one from the Phoenix Project. And this is a call to action. I say this in all my talks because I really want this to happen. 
If I can do it with the UI, for the love of God, let me do it with an API. I'm so sick of logging into my nth web console that's going to make my life better, which never really happens. I only want to like write REST recalls to those things and pull the data that I own out of them and do with it what I please. I'm like so sick of logging into web consoles. So please bug all the vendors, be nice to them out here in the hall because they sponsor this conference. But ask them, when are you going to give me a sane REST API, please, so I can automate this stuff? And honestly, like I talked to um, Shannon Leitz at... Um, into it, and they won't even consider tools that don't have APIs. That is like one of the first questions they ask. You got an API, you don't, bye bye Not done. Because if you can't automate it, that means some poor Joe or Joe at is going to have to log into that sucker and pull results. And that's just not cool. And it's burning human time that you shouldn't have to burn. <coughs> AppSec chat ops, right? Making chat the way you do security. Um, Aaron... Uh, Weaver, who's my co-presenter, who should be here, but he's on a train because we weren't initially speaking in this time slot, um, did a great lightning talk on this. I hope you saw it. I did. It was great. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about this. At Pearson, we created an AppSec bot to give advice because we were 24-7, 365, every continent except for Antarctica kind of business. So I am in the central time zone, and I like to sleep. So when I was sleeping, at least devs could say, what do I do about cross-site scripting? And we could at least give them a little blurb and a link to the, our internal documentation of how we wanted them to fix cross-site scripting at Pearson, right? And this thing could just live as a bot in our public AppSec channel, and off you go. We did a bunch of things like summary metrics for how the program was doing for the drive-by manager things. What's the vulnerability counts of AppX? You could ask the bot what's the counts of AppX, and it would give them to you. All those kind of things we just stuck into the chat bot. And yes, we started with advice and we added, I don't know, a handful of features to it over time. Surprisingly simple things to do. And Aaron says that it kind of turned chat into his own little command line, and I completely agree with that. It was amazing how much I actually liked chat. It was like another terminal for me that was cool. Prettier than a terminal. <coughs> this is from Aaron. He's doing this where he's currently working. He has chat integration with Signal Sciences lap like thing where it will drop into a Slack chat when they're getting attacked. Hey, by the way, this IP was doing this nasty against our website, and I just want to let you know, by the way, we blocked it because it beat our threshold, right? So now you're getting like security awareness at your chat. You can react it or not what you have to do, but this is a much better way to sort of ingest information than write a report. Oh, and then the last bit, this is more of a DevOpsy thing. CAMs or CALMs, depending on how you want to do it, right, which is culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. Or if you want CALMs, you add lean in there. But this is something I think from DevOps that we should really, really steal in the AppSec world. Culture is a big thing. Like, this, I've said this earlier at the conference, like, it's a very small pond. Like, let's not pee in it. One thing to our AppSec brethren and sisterin. But two, like, you got to deal with these devs. Like, understand that they have goals and aspirations and managers, you know, up their back um, as much as all of us do. Like, try to be nice to them. You'd be amazed if you're nice to people. They might actually be nice back to you. Automation is huge. I've already talked about that, hopefully enough. Measurement. I was surprised at how much. I really, because we talked about when we were designing Bo about the engagement tracking and how long it takes, and I kind of really, mentally, I poo-pooed that as being an important thing. I really didn't think, like, whatever, we'll put it in there. We'll never look at it. I used the heck out of that. That was ridiculously useful, knowing who's on first, how much time it took, all those kind of things. Because now I'm not from the hip telling you know, my boss, it's going to take so long to be done. I can say, it's going to take so long to be done because the last 12 of them took that long. right? And I have a little bit of backup. And visibility, huge. right? Get rid of the drudgery. If nothing else, we all have to work 40 hours. All the independent, wealthy people raise their hand. No hands raised. Right? we got to work 40 hours a week or so. Like, Let's make the work we do not be drudgery. And if you're talking to a dev, talk to them like you'd want to be talked to. Right? Like, be in the FUD, doom and doom, we're all going to die. Like, That was one thing that was fantastic about Rack. We had really smart, intelligent, semi-aggressive developers. And if you tried to pull BS on them, they called you on it in your face rather dramatically in meetings. So you learned to... like decide that this is actually an issue where it's just something you don't feel comfortable with, right? It was a fan, it was ugly at first, but it was a fantastic growing experience for me. <coughs> so third, 
Continual experimentation and learning. Create a culture of innovation and experimentation. So you've got your pipeline, you've got some decent sources of feedback, and now you want to really go to the next level, right? The, 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 the prototypical uh, poster child for this is the chaos monkey of Netflix, right? We all know that one. Like, this is when they're experimenting learning at the edge. We don't maybe need to be there, but we should certainly shoot for there as an end goal. So <clears throat> what's next for AppSec pipelines, um, particularly for myself and Aaron's OWASP project, the OWASP AppSec pipeline project? Well, the things we're working on now is weaponizing Jenkins, right? CICD is Jenkins, and honestly, Jenkins is what we're using because it's easy and free and fairly popular. I don't care if it's Travis or whatever. We're trying to be as agnostic as possible about it. But whatever thing you're using to build your stuff, not only should it do unit testing and other things, like throw security checks in there. Why not? It's running. Hello, write a few. I did this at Rack for the container as a service product. I wrote a little bit of code that would, every time we had a check-in of code for the container project, it would build a container. It would drop on this code. It would make sure all the sys controls and all those other kernel things that are really, really important for containers were set up correctly, and it would one zero depending pass fail, right? And guess what? We the, the team nubbed an Ansible something, and it went red. And dude, <laughs> developers know red. Like they totally know red. And if you can red a Jenkins job, it will get addressed. And actually, what happened was I was walking in from with some coffee. And one of the container team guys walked up to me and said, hey, dude, we got this thing, and it's breaking. What's going on? And we figured it out. OK, we missed this one control. Let's change this thing. We worked it out, but it was actually great. I'm, once again, getting approached by developers saying, help me make this green, because they love green. Um, the other thing is, well, a couple key points. If you are writing things, particularly build breaking things, do not ever, 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 unless you don't like yourself or want to be taken as a joke for the rest of your life of that company, have false positives, if at all possible, in that thing. Write very, very specific tests. Right? You do not want to be the guy who broke the build because of your false positive. That is a great way to be shunted and worked around forever uh, the rest of your time anyway at that place. Right? Do not do that. Uh, the other thing is think about health checks versus scanning. Right, if you do a dynamic scan with a commercial dynamic scanner, it's going to send the 2,000 something or others at your site and see what happens. But you could run health checks. You could run a quick SSL eyes and make sure your SSL was OK. You could do a quick SSL check and make sure the thing wasn't about to expire. Those are like two or three second checks. You can run those things all the time. Like, why not? Break up that big list of some things that your scanner would do and start picking off the easy, quick ones and dump them into something like Jenkins. And now you can monitor the health, right? Maybe you go yellow if your SSL is about to expire, right? Those kind of things become possible. Um, the other thing you can do if you have the time and bandwidth and you're progressive enough is if you have a finding, write a test for it, right? We used to do something like this at Rack. We would usually write a quick and dirty Ruby, Python, whatever program to exercise the volume we found and hand it off to the devs. Hey, I found this way to knock over your service if I do this nasty thing. Here's some Python that does the nasty thing. You make it work, and when the nasty thing doesn't happen, when you run this, come get me, you're probably fixed and we'll retest. Right? If nothing else, you're not doing the, hey, there's cross-site scripting in this thing. Hey, I fixed it. No, you didn't. I did this variation. OK, I fixed it. No, you didn't. I did this variation. No, I fixed it. Right? That's just a bunk. Like, at least make sure when they come back to you that the their fix is as good as your ability to POC or write some quick little demo program to exercise that thing, right? Because the 50 different strings you would test for cross-site scripting say, drop it in that dumb little bit of Python and run them all at it, right? Why not? Um, and then you have to think about cadence when you start doing this. Some tests are just going to take longer to run than others. And maybe you don't, depending on how fast your build and deploy process is with the like 75 times a day guys at Rack. We just realized they're going to deploy, I don't know, half a dozen times between our tests. And that's OK. Because when we find something and we raise the issue to the team, they'll fix it fast. That same team, we were testing them. And we found an issue in their API. And the guy who was working on it got on IRC with them and said, hey, guys, I noticed there's this thing. I can do this bad stuff. And this is what happened. They said, cool, can you send us the HTTP? Yep, here's my curl call. Here's my HTTP. The guy said, cool, thanks. Whatever, 
um, TJ kept working, right? Kept working, kept working. Ding on IRC, hey, what's up? It's fixed and in production. Duwabada, I'm not even done testing you. Like, so we literally opened and closed the bug for that issue because they fixed it before we could even write the thing up. So actually this like really fast, scary CI CD thing has some upside, like stuff gets fixed quick. We sat on a single sign on SQL injection at a place I worked in my past for a year because our waterfall was so bloody slow. Like I would much rather have to deal with crazy speed if fixes are crazy fast than sitting there and going, geez, a SQL injection on our SSO for a year. That ain't very cool, right? So think about the cadence and how long it takes to do those tests. <coughs> so this is the next sort of phase of where we're going with the AppSec pipeline. We're starting to do scaling and containerization of all these tests so that we can dynamically scale them up and down. This can be something as simple as this, right? Docker run, Kali pipeline, you're firing up the Kali um, uh, Docker image and running Nikto and putting the results out, right? This could be something that simple. It could be something like what we're working on now and I wanted to demo here and it's just not done. It's writing some little tools that know how to launch containers for you and then firing those off when you need them with whatever metadata they need to pass into the container to make that happen. So you want to do a quick scan. Maybe you launch Zap, you get the Zap IP, and now you can talk to that and start asking it to do testing for you. Or maybe you're going to launch Nikto and have it uh, run the scan and drop the results into a place that lives longer than that Docker. Because ideally, those Dockers live as long as we need them and then we kill them. Right? Up, down. I do the same thing. I build a bunch of packages for the OSWT project. And I literally bring up a 1604 Docker, build my packages, pull the artifacts off, and I kill the Docker, right? As somebody who's been running Linux and building packages for a long time, not having a crufty Linux is really nice. Um, but it's actually just really cool, too, because I get a very bare minimum system to test those packages in. But this is what we're working towards. Um, benefits, it super scales easy. And once you do, I mean, Docker, I, I kind of love the shell game with Docker. Like, I can just launch a Docker in three seconds after you pull the image the first time, right? <laughs> Buyer beware. So pull the image first, it'll take a bit, fine. After that, it's fast. Second time, crazy fast. First time, not so much. Um, but the nice thing is, too, like you get a Docker image you like for the tool of your choice, you can use that thing anywhere. I can use it on my laptop, I can use it on a server in a server, in a data center, or wherever, it doesn't matter, right? Deployment, stupid easy. You have one argument to get one box in the data centers you care about, and then you throw Docker tools at them. Done. Right? That's much easier to get the one box in the one data center and then just build dockers on them than to have to get the 17 boxes and firewalls and all that other hoo-ha. And then we've been talking about this idea of either pull in or scale out. So you could build the Docker images on your Jenkins or whatever your CI CD server is and just fire them off there, right? Locally run, all of your dockers live there, no problem. You could also, though, if you want to really scale this out, just talk out with Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or orchestration of your choice and start dynamically popping these things wherever they need to be popped, run them and kill them, right? Which is really, you start to get there, it gets really powerful, right? You have a decent, you must be this high to ride the ride profile for Zap. It's not a great security test, but it's pretty good and you have thousands of apps. You can now actually run that feasibly if you horizontally scale that thing enough across all of your apps. Now, do you have a super thorough investigation of all your apps? No, but you kind of have an idea if there's any really ridiculous low-hanging fruit across your suite of apps, right? Which is also really pretty cool. <coughs> oh, AppSec program for, AppSec pipeline for open source. So one of the things we've been playing around with is the uh, Jenkins pipeline, uh, build pipeline. And adding a security test section, you can create like little different tests as you go from whatever to built. We've been sticking in little security tests in that same build pipeline built into Jenkins. And those are the things that are firing off Docker or custom scripts like Gauntlet or something else to actually do those tests as part of the build pipeline. And now that it's in Jenkins, it's kind of nice. You have your own little build thing. It's pretty sweet. And we went back and forth, by the way, with doing a doing a plug-in or not, but I'm trying to keep this as CI, CD tool, Jenkins agnostic as possible because I don't want to, you know, if you don't have Jenkins, this is an open source project. If you don't have Jenkins, I'd like you to be able to run it, right? I don't want you to have to, and plus I just don't want to have to hassle with tying myself to a particular something. That's just me. 
<coughs> and then this was a great idea that Aaron had. I'll credit him. He should be here, but he's on a train. Um, to do pipeline as code. And really the concept here is you define the different stages of your pipeline, and then you dynamically pull from GitHub the tests that you want to run. And now if you want to expand or remove tests, it's a PR in GitHub. It's not a muddle with the thing that's on your build server, which is really, really cool. That's super cool. Um, and then I just said, I outed myself. I'm a full-time employee for OWASP. One of the things I want to do is do this for OWASP, for the OWASP projects. And when I get very sort of, oh, I can't think of the good word for it. That isn't the inappropriate word that I used earlier, so I won't use it. But I want to have OWASP project test OWASP projects in a build pipeline. So I want to have Zap fire up, poke at security set shepherd, and when it has the results, dump them in Dojo, which is a thread fixed like thing that's an OWASP project, right? So why not do that? And now if you're an OWASP project, I'm going to continually poke at you with these baseline things. They're not super thorough things. But I can also run things like Bandit for Python programs or uh, Scrutinize, and there's all those other .o things that will go look at your source code. Why not wire up all that junk automatically for OWASP projects and, and have uh, assurance that there's at least some level of testing going on with every OWASP project? And I can POC this very publicly, and you can use that to do whatever you need to do inside of your businesses. So that's kind of my goal. <coughs> this is the OWASP AppSec pipeline project. Um, it's myself and Aaron and Matt Kahn has been involved in it as well. Um, we're happy to have volunteers or donations or help. One of the things we're looking for is if you do have any of this or you do set this up, I would like to have more examples. I almost hate to show you the Pearson example because that worked awesome for Pearson, which isn't where you work, except for some of you, maybe, right? Most of you don't work for Pearson, so that pipeline that worked awesome for Pearson won't work awesome for you. You really got to build your own. We're trying to kind of basically make a menu of things that fit the different pieces of the pipeline and then letting you order what makes sense for your business. That's kind of the end goal. So we really want to be a collection of ideas because the context of your business. Perfect example, we talked about using ServiceNow at Pearson to do the intake, what ended up becoming bag of holding. But to be bluntly honest with you politically and environmentally, the administration of ServiceNow was so broken at Pearson, it would take us three to four weeks to get any change made, and it was usually made wrong. And then we'd have to wait three or four weeks to fix that. So we finally said, we're done with ServiceNow, we're writing around, because at least we control our destiny. But if you, I had one, someone in a class of mine say, well, we have ServiceNow, and man, the admins are awesome, and we use it for everything. And I'm like, dude, don't even use Bo, use ServiceNow. Why the heck would you bring something in when you have something that works, right? That's why I don't want to prescribe something to you. It's more of a concept. So these are the things that are cool and work. No, this is Defect Dojo. This is what the dashboard looks like. It is also an OWASP project. <coughs> if you need a place to track engagements and vulnerabilities, Defect Dojo will do that for you. Um, oh, Aaron Weaver, who's not here, and this is me. I have about 15 minutes, apparently. I will happily take questions. Yes. No. <laughs> well, I mean, to clarify, you asked if we were doing 75 deployments per day, did we do the high plan on all of them? Absolutely not. In the case of that group, um, we were starting to get things into their CI, CD that did some very rudimentary checks, and then those were using webhooks or other means to get them into our vulnerability management system. Does that make sense? So for them, they're moving so fast. Now, for them, we'd also do things, though, like take um, tests that took way longer than their, their churn, and we would just run them every week. And you know what? So what? Like, we go four or five days without knowing. It's better than not knowing. So yeah, that's, that's what I was talking about, cadence. Does that make sense? Awesome. Yes. Yeah, I'll be honest with you um, on both of those, on threat modeling and on uh, manual pen testing. I don't see those as activities going away. 
in the unicorn blue sky happy world that I'd like to be in, I would have a whole bunch of the kind of generic tests you do in a pen test automatically done. And then those n number of things you can't automate waiting for me to do manually. Because if you do a full manual pen test, you do stupid things like check SSL certs. Right? Well, heck, if I have it automated, I can just look at the thing. And these are all green. I don't need to do those tests. Let me do the business logic and those other tests that, that you're never going to automate, right? And then for threat modeling, I don't care what anybody says. I like a whiteboard and markers and people in the room. I mean, that's just what I do. <laughs> it doesn't scale, mind you, but it's way better. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Not all tests have to be blocking tests, right? When I talked about cadence, so it takes you a week to do a manual pen test, let's say. And let's say you're deploying every day. So maybe you will get four deploys in as you're testing. And maybe that code base is going to shift as you're testing, so it's not ideal. But if there are some problems, you're going to find them. And you can report them at the end of that five days. And it's certainly better than just not doing it at all. I mean, there are certain things you're just never going to automate, right? I mean, I've found some like amazing uh, business logic issues in some of the apps I've tested that I, I couldn't imagine. If I knew them, I might be able to audit or automate checking for them, but I have to know them. <laughs> I couldn't have found them dynamically. Any other questions? Yes? When's my next AppSec pipeline class? I will be teaching an AppSec pipeline class at LastCon in Austin in the very beginning of November-ish. I don't remember the date. Go to lastcon.org. And I, I'm sorry? November 1st and 2nd. November 1st and 2nd. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming to a very late presentation. If you have other questions you want to ask me afterwards, come on up. I don't care. I'll turn off the mic so it's private.